an hour. Um, I've just picked 15, 20 minutes. And then you can listen to it. You can ask any questions. If you want to listen to the whole, uh, the whole one hour, then it's going to be on the site and you can listen to the whole one hour. So I'm going to sort of, uh, I've got to do it manually. I'm going to start and you, you'll see it's preparing players for the future game. And um, speaking with him and, and uh, Arsene Wenger and other pe uh, people um, that I'm close to, um, I think this is a, a big topic and it's a big topic for Kerber. You know, what is the future player, the future team going to look like? So when Gerald and I decided, you know, to, to do this for you, um, we wanted a conversation really, rather than a lecture. And so we did this. So I'll start and stop it guys. And I'm not the best technically, but I'll try. So we'll start and just listen. And then at the end, we'll have a Q and A. So it's great to be with Gerald Houllier, um, one of the great coaches and uh, a very old friend of mine. And we're going to talk about a topic um, that hopefully is interesting, certainly topical, um, and that's preparing players for the future game. So, Gerald, welcome, and thank you very much for uh, talking with us. Thank you, Alfred, for inviting me to uh, take part into your webinar. Great. Um, Gerald, um, because maybe some of the people listening don't know about our pretty long relationship, more than 20 odd years, I guess. Um, so um, I think I first met you when you uh, uh, kindly invited me to give some advice on the future training or the future focus of training of the French Federation where you were technical director. Um, maybe just in a, a, a couple of minutes, uh, recap that, that, uh, that whole first meeting and, and what it led to. Um, well, I'll try in a few words to uh, explain how we met. Um, we, I, I was the coach of the national team when uh, Platini one day told me uh, the French player is very good um, physically and tactically, but not that good technically, and he lacks creativity. And that uh, really uh, struck my mind. And I decided to work in the content of um, the development of a player on that particular aspect and to bring innovation, um, creativity, uh, spontaneous uh, uh, movement in the technique, in the skill. And that's, I think, one day we met and you explained to me what you were doing and you had to demonstrate in front of the national coaches which uh, the national coaches' population is very uh, difficult to handle because they think they know everything. But they were absolutely, uh, I would say, dazzled by what you were doing. Then we passed on to the regional coaches, and the photo that we see is all the regional coaches. And uh, we also uh, work with the coaches of the between 12 and 15. Uh, player, the range of 12 and 15, because I had created the what I call the pre academy uh, centers, elite centers, as they're called now. And from there comes Thierry Henry, you know, Anelka, uh, Mbappe. And of course, you met him, Jacquet, who is uh, holding the World Cup with you. But I can say that you really you contributed to a change in the culture of football at that time. So uh, thank you, Gerald. And um, I think it's also relevant to our conversation today because this is many years ago, but I think your vision was preparing the future player, which is the topic today. Um, yeah, the, 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 it's, it's uh, great. The technical to, director, I mean, the, when you're technical director, when you're a coach, you need to think what is football going to be like in 10 years. Yeah. When you are a national coach, it's different. You prepare for the next 10 days when you are uh, a coach and when you prepare players, when you are more an academy for the coach, for instance, when you work with the youth or when you're a technical director, is different. But I mean, you need to have a vision and you need to know where we're going and what we have to work um, on a more privileged way. Yes. Okay, so um, what happened? Sorry, let me go on. 
Um, so, Gerald, uh, excuse me. Um, okay, so uh, after this, guys, um, what Gerald and I discussed was the, the past, really, from um, the teams of the 70s to the current uh, teams uh, or team stars. And you'll be able to hear this uh, uh, on site. So I don't want to go through it because I want to be more interactive with you today. So I'm going to go on to when we actually, we looked at the past and we saw uh, certain things that happened in the past, you know, certain, the Brazil team of the 70s, the Dutch, te uh, the, the Dutch team, sorry, the Brazil team of uh, the 1960s and 70s, uh, the Dutch team, the total football, the Italian uh, uh, team, how they influence or the Italian style of football. And, and we saw a trend. And so when you listen to the whole thing, you'll see basically very, very quickly, we summarized the trend, which then gave us clues about what the future was going to be like. So I want to sort of fast forward onto that. And if you just bear with me to, to go on to, to where it is. Okay, hang on. Okay. So, like it, it works by cycles. Yeah. At the moment, what in fashion is, what in fashion is, even Champions League or national team is um, fast attack, quick, quick attack, you know. Um, but coming from a very quick transition. Yeah. So, um, Michel, let's talk. And of course, this is very brief because I think this topic could take two days to talk about. But mm -hmm. the future, and I put these two pictures up, uh, two teams that may, and I say may because, like you say, I, th I know things are in cycles, mm -hmm. may uh, be the future team stroke player. Yeah, um, probably because. Um, you can have, um, first of all, everybody contributes to the task of, uh, of the football game. That means whether it was defending, attacking, everybody does that. You can be, a, uh, for instance, Davis, for instance, the Canadian guy. Not only can he defend well, but he can also attack very well, like a Brazilian in the old days. Uh, same for Pava. So you, I mean, you, you have, um, what I say, experts, but with, they, they've got a speciality, you know, for example, Bledanowski is, uh, is a striker and, and a center forward, and this is his speciality, but he plays a part in the defending side. That means you have experts who are able to do other things in their other field, not only their own field. So that means, you can have good wingers, but they've got to defend as well. And in fact, you can have good defenders, good fullbacks, but they have they need to be able to attack as well. You know, it doesn't mean total football. It means to me is you have really specialist experts in their position, but can do you know also more than that. You know, they have their strengths. Their top strengths is what they characterize them, but on top of that, they can do something special in defending or attacking. <laughs> For instance, Goretzka, I think he scored a goal, uh, I think it was against Paris. Uh, he's a mid defensive midfield, but he can play. He can play. I mean, he, you don't have, I mean, the evolution of the game makes force. Uh, it, it makes us think that we, have, we need to have an evolution of a player. Uh, the future of the player. The player has got to be different. It's got to be more comprehensive, probably, to have, you know, an asset, special asset, and do the other thing. Yeah, it, it can't be a burden to his team. Yes, it seems because we, we, we've been talking about the past influence on the future, and the, all the things we talked about, the total football, the German mentality, the, the, the Spanish uh, creativity, the, the French uh, effectiveness is all coming together, really. Yeah. So um, the future team, Jao, uh, in this slide, um, I, think, uh, I think all these are valid. Um, 
would you agree that probably, certainly in the grassroots game, uh, sorry, certainly in the professional game, um, in the grassroots game, maybe not, but the, that speculative long ball that we probably grew up with um, is almost disappearing. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Because the long ball, the quality of the defenders now is not only to... Um, if you play a long ball, you have 80% chance to lose the ball. You give the ball away. Because now the defenders, not only they can defend, but they can have a first pass. So when he leads, he will see where with the header he can find a defensive midfield or a fullback. So in fact, the defenders have got so, I mean, they, they've kept their defending skills, but they're more technical. They're more, I would say, they, they can read the game and they can, when they, they don't clear the ball, they pass the ball, even under pressure. So that means if you play the long ball, I mean, you lose it. So any, any um, coach will tell you that it's better to, to keep the ball because, I mean, so it's better to start from the back. A lot of teams start from the back and start building up from the back. And, and therefore, it's almost um, what it has um, we've inherited from, the, from, say, the Barcelona era, uh, maybe even the total football era, is that possession is the best form of defence. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, um, the future player, Charles. So I think you've already said that they need to be expert, but but uh, in attack and defend. But they both. Well, look at look at Manny. Manny is is a striker. Yeah. He can play centre forward. He can play left back, left left winger. Sorry, but if he, he, he finds something in position as a left back, nearly, um, be, be, because whether it's Manny or Salah, they have to drop, they have to press, and they have also. It doesn't mean they will tackle or they will um, play the challenge with the same intensity as the others, but they need to take part into the regaining of the ball. And same, uh, when they have the ball, the defenders need to be able to play, for instance, the fullback now. I mean, there's the three positions which have changed a lot, uh, if you may, if you allow me to say, after this one is the two fullbacks. And I think credit has got to be given to the Brazilian because they developed that. The two fullbacks now are the people who've got a bit of space and time. So they need to be good footballers and be able to attack. Not only overlap. I mean, this is a classic thing, overlap. But the fullbacks gets inside. He gets in between the opposition uh, centre-back and uh, fullback. So that means... He has to be able to create, you know, some movement, to create some games, to be able to sometimes beat players and so on. So that means the players are experts, but they need also to be able to respond to the other task of the game. And I think that the, that example of the wing backs or full backs in, in our day, Gerald, and know, the defensive uh, midfield, because there is no yeah, defensive midfield. the defensive midfield in front of the defence, what they call, you know, the anchor man or the uh, libero in front of the defence, whatever, is one man who really a lot of because I mean the opposition usually they retreat, they go back. Yeah. So where the defensive midfield has got a bit of freedom, particularly if he drops in between the two uh, centre backs. And he can sort of uh, start the game, orient it, you know, his pass, his first pass will probably um, uh, incite the, the, the whole team to go that way, that route, and so on. So that's why, you need, I mean, Busquets have done for years that for, for Barcelona, the national team of, uh, of, of Spain. So another position that's kind of changed um, during our lifetime, Gerald, is the role of the goalkeeper, right? Oh, I, mean, I forgot to mention that when I saw Noya. I mean, I think Noya won the, the Champions League from uh, Bayern Munich. I mean, of course, the other players played their part, but Noya, not only was, not only, not only he, he sometimes gets out, I mean, Noya, and you, you show Edison is another example. Edison was recruited by Guardiola because he could play. You know, his passing, of, when we say everything starts from the back, that means it starts also with the goalkeeper. Yeah. And because a lot of teams press you, you've got to give the ball to a player who will have a bit of time to turn and give. 
that accuracy in the passing, whether it's with your feet, because with a new rule, or your hand, is very important. I think Neuer, not only, of course, he, he made uh, some important saves uh, uh, for his team at an important moment in the game, whether it was against uh, Lyon or against the Paris Saint-Germain in the final. But Neuer can play. He, he, he's, like an, he's like an extra player. He's not, he's not the goalkeeper. He's a 12 player on the field. Yeah. Um, because he, he's outside the box and he can, he can be like a river or he can... He offers a, a solution of passes sometimes when you're under pressure. Uh, yes, it's like having 11. If, if the other team don't have a goalkeeper like that, it's like 11 v 10. Um, yeah. and, and when you yeah. look at the, the statistics on the screen now, Gerard, um, uh, this is the statistics that Xavi or any midfield player would be proud of. Short pass accuracy, short pass accuracy, yeah. you know. Yeah, ninety-nine percent. That tells you. I, I, I mean, so he, he or she, and long pass accuracy, yeah. seventy-five, seventy-eight, uh, fifty-eight. Sorry, yeah. that means that means if you play long ball, you've got a good chance to lose a ball. That's what I told you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Joe, uh, very quickly again, uh, we we're covering this very briefly because of time, but. Um, so let's look at uh, how we can develop the future player. And I think um, here, um, the, the, on the slide we put from kindergarten to university, and I know when you and I have talked over the many years we, we, we work with each other and been friends, um, and you, your background is also in education, so you understand it's so much more than many other coaches that I've worked with around the world, um, that when you educate, you have to go through the steps of education whether it's academic education or football education, would you agree that's the same? Yeah, exactly the same. You build that. Quite yeah. good. So um, we start with the kindergarten, and you know, the little ones, four to seven. And um, if we're developing the future uh, player, um, and I don't think it's changed from the past, but you've got to get kids to love the game by enjoying the game. I, I don't think it's a, a place for drills or, 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 or positions or anything. No, it's just it's just the fact that you you play four aside, five aside, you know, maximum six aside. That's all, yeah. so that they can touch the ball a lot of times. And then they go to primary school, the second level, and here's where um, I think it's an important age where repetition is really important. But repetition can be boring, and that's why um, in in the curve program we try to mix. Uh, uh, we we realise repetition is boring. So we try to hide it in, um, you know, fun games in some way because they're still little babies, right, between 7 and 12. You're right. Um, the, 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 again, you, you have short spaces, mm. uh, which is, I think, very important because uh, to... to uh, short spaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah short, um, you know, reduce space uh, mm. because for them, touching the ball very often or also being used to that because the modern game you don't have a lot of time and space now so you need to be able to uh, use your skill in very short spaces and also um, as you said you know they don't like drills and all like that they, they just like the game enjoying the game and yeah. you develop a lot of the skills through games on top of what you do at training and then we go to high school, and uh, I, when we were talking before, you, you mentioned physicality, which is quite right. This is between 12 and 16 years old, where the boys and girls become more powerful. I mean, boys much more than girls, I guess, um, mm -hmm. but more, more, more physical. And that's when nearly all around the world, kids start playing 11 v 11, because under 12, they're playing 77, 99, 5 v 5. So um, this is an important, uh, this is when, I guess they start thinking what role in the team. Yeah, th this is probably the, the most important phase of the development to me. Yeah. The most difficult one as well, because you really have to anchor the, 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 the skills into the player and also start developing, as you say, space and his role in the team. So it's um, it's a it's a play it's um, I would say a phase it's a, a step where you really have to work on skills plus a bit of uh, 
uh, uh, maybe quickness or pace and some speed. And then they go to university, um, phase four, where uh, the boys and girls, again, boys probably more um, depend on power here. And, and I suppose that changes your training, uh, the, the weight, weights and, 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 and physical work becomes part of your training. Um, but um, one other point that I particularly like in this age group is what we call position specific um, training. So that, you know, training with strikers, training with midfield players, training with the uh, wing backs, training with the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper for many years has been like that. But I think this age group is appropriate for that, don't you? Yes. And also, uh, as you said, position specific or tactical. Mm -hmm. um, because the mind can, can abstract. You know, it's uh, in the development of the, of the brain. This is the area where you, this is the time where you can really uh, work on tactics and so on and develop in players uh, a few things that you know that will help them in their career before after that. So that means it's more I would say I, mean, the, I don't think that after a certain age you can influence a lot of the technique. Of course, you know we improve at every age. Some people will tell you, but this is the age where the tactical side and the physical side are very important. Yeah. So, um, Gerald, this is what, um, and it hasn't changed a lot in the last 20 years. I think we've always needed this, but, but I still think for the future, to the question, how do we develop the future player, as you and I have discussed, is, is one with strong mentality, uh, good work ethic, good skills, uh, can play attacker and defender. Um, and for us, um, um, the question always then to the coach or the teacher is, well, you've described what you want to do, how do you do it? And for us, um, we, we, in, in co coaching over these 35 years, we've developed a curriculum and a method to teach. So I think whatever that, whatever happens and whatever you believe in, I think always if you're a, a coach, a development coach, it's always well, what do you teach and how do you teach it? And now you've had a long background, uh, of course, at the very top of the game uh, with Liverpool and the French national team, etc. But you've also you are an educator, and so would you agree that whatever the future player in the game is, that how they're educated between four years old and seventeen years old is hugely important. Yeah, paramount important. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um you you get a good flower you get a good plant if once the seed is in there you regularly work upon that you know you water it you look after it and you repeat things this is very important uh, i mean that you know uh, the quality of the player depends on the quality of his development yeah, well, um, Charles, and we've tried to cover probably a week's work in an hour. So thank you very much. Uh, it's, you know, it's great to see yeah. you, my friend, and um, we'll, we'll speak soon. Yeah, it was a pleasure, as always, Alfred. Take care. Um, okay, guys, so um, uh, as I said, it, the whole hour will be um, uh, uh, on, on the site. Um, he's, uh, he's such a, a knowledgeable yet very humble sort of guy and he is one of the most um i think uh, and i've met a lot of coaches in my career um one of the guys that you should listen to i should listen to um it's a world of uh, you know he's got a global experience um he's uh, speaks to you see his english is better than my english um so this is a, a special person and for, for Kerber Coaching, um, our association with the French Federation, I think really, if you ask me one single thing that uh, elevated the credibility of Kerber, and that was the 12 years that we worked with the French Federation. Um, so, um, Mike, uh, ready for questions? Yep. Uh, good job, Dad. No, thanks for the presentation. And, and please pass on our thanks to Gerard, too. That was really good. Um, we have a question from our colleague, Guy. Guy de Mel in France, um, and the questions regarding goalkeepers yeah. and their increased importance in the game. 
and um, your advice about how they participate in the ball mastery exercises and the mix that they can get involved in in the actual player sessions as well to help them improve their their uh, football technical ability as well. Yeah, so, um, so w w when you're session planning um, and, you know, you, in the curve session plan, you know, we start with ball mastery, speed, 1v1. In the ball mastery and speed, I would include them as a, a exactly the same as the rest of the players, uh, certainly up to the time they're 14, 15. Um, um, now, at pro clubs, because the, the boys and girls are in, uh, you know, uh, sort of well, the boys at the moment, unfortunately, hopefully the girls one day, um, they're in after 12 years old, five days a week. Then you've got extra time to uh, the younger ages to work with the goalkeepers. But certainly in grassroots football, I would include goalkeepers. They do exactly the same in ball mastery. They do exactly the same in, in speed work. Um, you involve them in small-sided games as field players. And therefore, by the time, you know, if they start at seven or eight and they do this, by the time they're 12, 13, 14, 15, um, so the goalkeeper, what's the main core skill for a goalkeeper? It's receiving the ball and, and passing the ball. It's not 1v1, obviously, and it's not shooting. So um, that's what I would do. I would just not look at them as goalkeepers uh, in your training sessions. Um, and um, then if you want extra specialised goalkeeping uh, uh, practice, OK, you can arrange that at the beginning or at the end. But um, I think one of the beauties of Curva is that ball mastery. Um, so, so what, you know, remember we taught ball mastery equals ball feeling. Ball feeling equals better first touch. What does a goalkeeper need? A good first touch. Because the goalkeeper is the 11th player um, now. And so, especially defenders rely on passing back and he can't pick it, or he or she can't pick the ball up anymore. So, it, it's, um, that's what I would advise. Think they're a field player. Okay. Um, question from uh, Mike regarding transition, as um, it was, I guess, a, a fundamental part of uh, the future game or the current game as well. How, can you summarise how Curver encourages transition in our sessions? Um, Yes, yeah, so uh, um, we call it fast break attacking curva, um, and that came, you know, from the 1997 uh, pyramid play development Charlie and I developed. And uh, Charlie, it was actually Charlie's uh, watching American basketball. And so that word transition, we don't really use, we call it fast break attack. Remember, uh, we talked about curva having um, uh, a language, a, you know, a, a global language. Um, so, and, and you know, then it's in the drill DNA. Uh, uh, so in, if you go in the Curva library, you look at the Curva drills, um, you know, we've got many, many fast break attack exercises, which are suitable from, you know, the little ones, seven, eight, up to the 21s. Um, and um, so uh, we, we, we have them, um, but we call that transition fast break attack. Okay, um, a question from uh, one of our colleagues um, regarding where, where you think the game's going to go at the, the highest level. Um, and they talked about the Manchester City Tottenham game last weekend and the, the, the quality and the preciseness of all of the players. And, and I guess the question's mostly about well, where's the room for improvement at the moment when you have the very best players and teams? playing at such a high level? Well, uh, I suppose the, the thing I can think about is, well, how do you develop those players? Because that is a future game. I mean, the physicality and the power from, from say, my day, where you, now you're producing really fit, strong athletes. And so you're talking about the higher end of the game, and I'm interested in how do you develop? Well, obviously, uh, kids, boys or girls who are, uh, under 14, 15 have got no power and, and, and physicalities, you know, so okay, some kids are bigger than others. So to me, the question when you watch, uh, when I watch Man City and, and Tottenham, you see a typical Mourinho, and I've got all respect for him, not, not wanting to attack, just holding the 30 meter line. And you've got Man City wanting to attack. And so that becomes a game of chess a little bit. And, and th this time, uh, the team that were patient won. Um, but, but, you know, statistics are weird now um, at the top end. 
because a few years ago, the team that had most possession nearly all, at the top level, not at the grassroots level, nearly always won the game. And now it's changed a bit and it's about 60-40. Um, so my, my point is, when I look at Man City and Tottenham, I see Tottenham and I understand how, you know, uh, Mourinho's thinking, but that's not, you know, my philosophy. And, and I'm much nearer Guardiola, attack the other team and therefore play in the other team's half. And so then come, I'm not saying one's right or wrong. Kerber is an attacking philosophy. So I'm saying, well, the question you should ask as a development coach is how do you develop kids, boys and girls in the future that have that mentality and have the skills because they'll get the physicality and the power as they grow older to play that way. But it's, it is a mentality. And the point is, which mentality do you want to follow? Okay, thanks. Um, question from Mike Crooning. Um, Gerald talked about the inside overlap of the fullbacks. In what drills can we teach this to our players? Yeah, so we've got um, a lot of drills in the Kerber Library. Um, so um, you heard me talk about these combination partners. So when you look at the 48 1v1s and then you look at the combinations, uh, so you go to the pyramid of player development, you see the top part, it's a small group play. And in small group play, you see combinations. And in combinations, you have overlap, uh, wall pass, takeover, screen run, dummy. So, and then you look at the, you go into the menu for 1v1 and you'll see all 48 don't work with that. So maybe five work with an overlap and a wall pass. And then you develop a drill where the player overlaps. So the drill has overlaps, but you always give them the option of using the overlapper as a decoy. So that because of the curve and moves, you can do that. So you create an incredibly valuable player. So, but we have got the drills that do that, but I would just advise you, you need to include the 1v1 option. Okay. Um, and a final question. Uh, guys, if you've got any other questions, please put them in the chat. Um, regarding um, the future of the girls game and, and the female game, and what you think are the principal differences of where the girls game is now and where it could go in the future? compared to the, to the men's game? Well, you know, uh, from, I don't know if you, you heard the webinar I did with Christine Lee, but um, I first started working with the US national team in 1994. And uh, I became a convert, if you like. Um, I think that women's football is probably the future, but, um, or, or a big part of the future. Um, I don't think there's enough women coaches. Um, I think that um, governments, you know, uh, should encourage uh, girls when they're seven, eight, nine, ten to play in schools. That doesn't happen in most countries. Um, um, I know from, say, programs like Brad's in Sweden, in the Nordic areas, um, they're doing brilliantly. Um, so uh, I know in the US, uh, our colleagues are doing well. Um, I think we need all to sort of step up and try to encourage um, not only more players, but try to recruit more women coaches. And that's one of the sort of priorities of Kerber coaching. Absolutely. Um, okay, a couple of questions coming in now. Um, one from Joe. Hi, Joe, in Scotland. Um, whilst working to develop the players through the phases, how can we help partner club coaches to measure their progress season on season? And how do they then communicate that with the parents? Um, often parents just want to see the results and of the performances in game day. So how, how do you measure the progress with partner clubs and how do you communicate that to parents? Big, big question, Joe. Um, look, uh, first of all, in Scotland, Joe and, and Julian and, and, and Gordon and the coaches, they've, they've done a phenomenal job in the partner club. Uh, uh, angle and, and that's a business thing which Jimmy will discuss with you and Mike and, and but um, just congratulations on what you guys have done in clubs in Scotland um, so um, you got I think Joe you know as well as, well as me um, so what you're trying to do you're trying to help grassroots coaches who probably do this for, for fun or, or contribute or their mothers or their fathers so with great respect they're not you know, uh, professional coaches. And what you're trying to do is add some professionalism, whether it's the content, you know, the drills and games or, or how they teach. 
And like you do, you go and, you know, you do sessions for them, you give them session plans, you guide them. But you've got to remember that these are volunteers and, and um, so your experience is much different from theirs. So what you're really doing is giving them your experience, but then they need the hardware like session plans and, and drills and games. So you're doing that already. Measurement is a difficult thing because usually you measure things in football by winning. And um, in grassroots football, I don't think under 16, no, let's say, say under 14, that, that certainly isn't the curve of measurement. And then comes to your question, you better be able to explain it to the parents because they don't understand that. Um, if their kids lose, they think you're a bad coach and the club's a bad club. So um, one of the things we're working on, and if it's something that I was going to come on into the second lecture about products, uh, Joe, is, um, is a presentation of parents that I'm working on with Dr. Peter Bay. And to sort of make a presentation to explain, um, you know, what Curva does both on and off the field, because parents want to know what, you know, they also want to know, you know, can you help my kid if they're shy or, or, or they, you know, they're not confident. And, and that presentation, Joe, will be out soon and available to you all. Thanks, Joe. Um, lo last question, I think, from Guy in France. Um, Curva is an attacking philosophy, um, but how can we improve the defensive attitude of our players? Um, do, um, Guy's question is, are we going to develop the defensive part of the curriculum? Okay, uh, hi, Guy. Um, so we already have. Um, so, Guy, if you go into the, the pyramid of player development, um, back in 2003, where you saw 1v1, it's the red bit, bit um, when you saw 1v1, um, then um, uh, you saw it was, there was no defending. And back, so in 2003, we realized that when we looked at the curve of drills, um, then uh, when you looked at when an opponent was pressuring, they actually could be defending drills. In other words, a coach could have points both for attacking and defending. So we had the drills in our library. We just, we just weren't teaching defending. And so after 2003, you'll see many of the 1v1 and 2v2 drills in the Curva library. When you see a, an opponent, um, one week you focus on attacking. I wouldn't do both at the same time. And the next week, you look at it as to the point of defending tips. So, so we, we had this big library and we suddenly saw, well, the same things that we're doing for 1v1 and 2v2 full pressure, we can then take that same drill and we can do it for defending. But all we do is we look at the defender. So it's the same drill, but the coach is a different person. In, in the attacking one, the coach looks at the attacker. It doesn't worry too much about defending. Of course, it's got, you worry about safety. And, and the next week, you want to do that same drill. You don't worry too much about what the attacker does. You look at the defending points. And so, the same in small group play. So previously, in small group play, we always used to do attacking. But when we looked at the drills, and in small-sided games, conditional small-sided games, the same drills that we were doing for years, that we were looking at just attacking, now you look at the defending and you just teach the defending. I mean, the points are obvious. All I would advise you is don't do them in the same session. So if you, do, if you pick a drill from the library and you just focus on the attackers, next week you use exactly the same drill and you just focus on the defenders. And how do you, from an attitude perspective, how do you think um, you help improve the player's appetite motivation, et cetera, to defend? Is there a way to do that, to encourage them to, to, to build that up? So, you know, um, I don't know if you remember the webinar I did, um, I can't remember with who, but was saying that the Curva Kids mentality, when they become a player uh, in a team or a game, is lose, win, keep, attack. Lose, win, keep, attack. And therefore the DNA of your drill or some of your drills, as well as what you tell the parents, as well as what you tell the kids, is that in Curva, um, as in all football, you only have the ball maybe one, if you're playing, uh, if you're 12 years old and you're playing 90 minutes, you have the ball one minute out of the 90 minutes, 89 minutes you're without the ball. 
So you've got to win the ball first. So hence the curve, you know, uh, what you tell your communication, lose, win, keep attack, lose, win, keep attack. So you've got to lose and you lose the ball. You're going to lose the ball. If you don't lose the ball, you've got to win the ball. So that first part is a clear signal that we understand the football reality. You win out the ball most of the game. Great. All right. Thanks very much. That's um, the end of that session, guys. What we're going to do now is a little test. Um, I'm going to, I've started a poll. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's the first time I've ever done it, but you can basically vote on a couple of questions and we'll use this throughout the days. Uh, can you guys see that? There's Hi, been, Jim. can you see it, Em? Yes. Okay. Yep. Please vote. Yes. I don't see it, Jim. I think everyone else can. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> Scott said he can't see Aston Villa on the best future team illustration. Well, Unfortunately, he might be right, Jim. <laughs> Maybe. So we've done a poll there, Dad, just quickly to get everyone to interact a little bit about what team do you think best illustrates um, the future team? And we've got sort of the big hitters and some big hitter national teams. And then we've got players. What player do you think best illustrates the future player? Very good. Thanks, guys. We'll, we'll do that a bit more. It, it worked, which is great. So the consensus from the group is with 46%, 47% of the vote, 48% of the vote, Bayern Munich are the team that be, right now best illustrates the future team. Mm. Um, and then what player do you think best illustrates the future player? Oh, close, very close. We've got Virgil van Dijk in third position on 19%. Uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold, second, with 22% of the vote. And then, uh, at the moment, Kevin De Bruyne as the player that best illustrates the future player. Interesting. So, guys, thanks. Thanks for your participation. Um, what we're going to do now, we've got eight minutes to grab a coffee, uh, grab a biscuit, and then we'll meet you back for the next lecture at 11 a.m. Central European time. Go grab a coffee, guys. Thanks. Jim. Yeah. Oh, everyone is. So um, I've got a message at 2.30 French time is the possible time now. All right. Um, let me give you a call, Dad. Okay. Dad. Yeah. Uh, if you can go on mute, you know. Okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do.